wife, mother, grandmother, mother-in-law, sister, and a wonderful woman, Gail Farrow. All of us here have been um, touched and affected by Gail in some way, or else you wouldn't be here. You are connected to this family, either directly through Gail or indirectly through family members. Uh, Gail has been a part of this church for very many years. In fact, it would be important for you to know that the very building in which you're sitting right now has Gail's fingerprints all over it. She was on the team that helped design this building, which was completed during COVID. So this is our newest uh, facility on the property, and Gail had a big hand in making this happen. So it's appropriate that we would be here today, remembering her life and celebrating her life. Now, we call this a celebration of life because we believe that's what it is. I don't know all of you. I know that we all come from differing backgrounds. But here at Park Ridge, as is true of Gail's life as well, we believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so because of that, we approach the death of a sister in Christ differently than the world who does not believe what I just said approaches it. We believe that Gail is more alive today than she ever has been. And so the understanding of that obviously changes the way you look at things. And so as we go through this service today, the sadness that we feel is because she is no longer with us. That does not mean she no longer is. So, I don't know what you believe, but that's what we believe. And so because of that, we approach it from a different perspective. Now, I can say that she is more alive because I know where Gail stood with the Lord. I know generally where she stood because she was a part of this church and I heard her say a few things, but I know specifically where she stood and stands because of what she directly told me. And I know because of what I observed in her life. Not about her good works, but about her love for God. So, as we go through this service together, we're going to look at the Word of God. If we believe that He is real, then His Word is authentic and true. So that's why we use it as a text for life. We're going to sing songs to Him and about Him and remembering her. Some of the songs that she loved, we're going to sing today. We're going to pray. We're going to hear stories of her life and we're going to remember her. The goal is twofold. Number one, to lovingly and joyfully remember the life of Gail Farrow. And number two, and, and I would just say this is more important than number one, to worship God. That's why we're here. Because if he is who he says he is, then we know where Gail is and we can rejoice in that truth. So with that, I invite Pastor Brad Boyette to come and share from his heart and to open us in a, an opening prayer. Thank you. As Pastor Eddie said, my name is Brad Boyette. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, my condolences, sincere condolences to the family for your loss. Um, before we pray, I just want to share on behalf of Stacy and my family because in 2003, when Stacy and I came back to Park Ridge on staff, Pastor Darrell introduced me to Gail. As he said, meet Gail Farrow. She is our volunteer children's director. And thus began a 20-year relationship as she served the children's ministry so faithfully and served in so many ways um, at children's events like Trunk or Treat and Easter Egg Hunt. She served on an administrative leadership team. And as Pastor Eddie said, she helped design this building, but she also was on the decor team that appointed the building after it was finished. She served so many in so many families and so many children knew your mom, your wife, your grandmother. She affected and impacted so many people here at Park Ridge. She was, Stacy and I were 
discussing coming tonight and I was so grateful that I could have this time to share and then pray. We were talking about some things about Gail and we were reminiscing about her contagious smile. Her engulfing hugs. Not one of those I'm bear hug. You could see her in the children's hallway and it wasn't good morning. It was, come here, let me give you a hug. She was known for giving gifts. She was a gift giver. Any occasion she could find, she would give a gift. And she had a knack of making homemade cards, birthday cards, thinking of you cards, get well cards. She put others before herself in so many ways. We will greatly miss our sister. And I know, again, speaking on behalf of Stacy, who worked with Gail for many, many years in the children's department, we will miss her and never forget her. So will you allow me to pray? Heavenly Father, most gracious Lord, we thank you for the life of Gail, a wife, a mother, a grandmother, a friend, your servant. Lord, we thank you that she believed in you and she knew you here on this earth and we thank you that she knows you now truly in a way that we can only imagine. We thank you that she loves you and she's worshiping you. Lord, I pray for the family and these friends who have gathered that Lord, you would give them peace and comfort. Lord, it's so easy to ask why. But Lord, I pray that we would not ask why, we would ask what now? And how do you want us to go forward? And that is to share the love of Jesus Christ that Gail Farrow emulated so well. I pray for peace that transcends all understanding, a peace that only you can give this family and these friends. I pray that you bless this service, Lord, that it is honoring and glorifying to you as we remember the life and the love and the service of Gail Farrow. And it is in the matchless name of Jesus that I pray this prayer. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, thanks for joining us to honor the life and the legacy of my mom. We're all grieved by her unexpected and untimely passing. And the magnitude of this grief is a direct result of the person that she was and the life that she lived. And it hurts the way that it does because of what she meant to each of us. In my grief, I've chosen to keep three things at the forefront of my mind. I believe in God's sovereignty and goodness. I celebrate the life that she lived and the relationship that we had. And I believe she's in a better place and that I'll see her again. And while I embrace all of these, I also choose to acknowledge and feel the full weight of her absence so that I can fully appreciate the gift that she was while she was here. Each of us had a unique relationship with my mom. And since she passed, I've heard countless stories from all of you about what she meant to you. And with each new story, I see her love and her beauty from new angles. My mom loved being a mom and she loved being a Mimi. She also loved her extended family, friends and community. 
She loved a vibrant life of generosity and abundance. And so today, I'd like to share a few lessons, six, that I learned from my mom over the last 32 years. Number one, my mom taught me the importance of creating and maintaining traditions. My mom loved traditions. Pizza Fridays, burger Saturdays, movie nights. After I moved out of the state, uh, my mom started sending me personalized cards for every holiday, birthday, and they were always filled with confetti, which drove me nuts. <laughs> because after 10 years, it still caught me off guard every time. I had a birthday last month and ended up with confetti all over my cooktop in my kitchen. And while she religiously maintained those traditions, she also had a very interesting relationship with time. Whenever we were getting ready to start a movie, we would all be sitting on the couch, ready to go, but Gail was nowhere to be seen. And we'd call out to her and say, hey Gail, we're ready to start the movie. She'd say, I'm coming. But we always knew that meant we were probably at least 30 minutes away from starting that movie. <laughs> then when we would finally start that movie much later than expected, she would fall asleep. But she would always deny that she was asleep. According to her, she was just resting her eyes. So I started quizzing her on what she missed during those snoozes. But eventually I graduated to more reliable methods, like discreetly putting peanut butter on her lips. You know, at some random point in the movie, you know, you'd hear her so all of a sudden the, licks, the lips start smacking. That's when I knew I won the battle that night. One time I decided to take it up a notch and she fell asleep and I grabbed a pen and I drew an elaborate image on her foot. And so when she woke up and denied having fallen asleep, I got a lot of satisfaction out of telling her to take a look at her foot. But for decades, my mom made traditions a priority and as a family, we were enriched by that and continue to be enriched by that as we maintain old traditions and start new ones. Her consistency and commitment to traditions leave my family today with countless memories of my mom that we'll be able to cherish for the rest of our lives. Number two, my mom taught me that true joy is found when you're generous with your time and with your resources. One of the reasons my mom was always running behind was because she had, was constantly in contact with so many people. She had this uncanny ability to make everyone around her feel special and important. It's blown me away to find out how many people she spoke with the evening that she passed away. That's what my mom was all about. She cared deeply and wanted to show it regularly. Since I left Florida a decade ago, we still remained in daily contact. Calls on the way home from the gym, frequent visits. She came four times. We moved to Kansas a year, a year ago. She's been four times <laughs> since we moved there. Um, frequent video chats with our kids. She loved deeply and gave generously. And that's why her passing has been so hard. Whenever she would visit, she'd leave notes around the house. And whenever she dropped me off at the airport or when I would drop her off, she always needed one more hug. Anyone who's ever dropped my mom off at the airport, it's always about one more hug. So I vividly remember uh, in 2013, when I left Florida to move to Seattle, my mom dropped me off at the airport. It's the, the, big, the big move day. And of course she had to park the car, had to walk me into the airport. She initiated that first hug before we even got out of the parking lot. Then she proceeded to stand in the security line with me, asking for one more hug every few minutes. And then even as I had to leave her and pass through the security checkpoint, I looked back and I saw her standing on top of the highest thing she could find, just waving. Um, but that's what my mom was all about. Um, she was so full of love and she couldn't help but let it overflow and show it to those around her. And she also loved to give tangible gifts, as Brad had mentioned. Growing up, our garage was always full of Spherion trinkets and random stuff that she bought. Um, I have a bag of Spherion uh, hand sanitizer at my house. I don't know when I'm going to go through all of that. Um, we had such a large back stock of school supplies that my friend Andres used to literally do his back-to-school shopping in our garage. He'd bring the list to my mom. There was so much clutter, but she always knew exactly where everything was and she was always ready and willing to meet any tangible need that came in front of her. Number three, my mom taught me that you shouldn't take yourself too seriously. When we were growing up, she was terrified at the sight of cockroaches. She saw one, she would scream. So as a thoughtful, supportive teenager, 
I decided to help her work through that fear. I decided to buy a bunch of plastic cockroaches, woke up really early the next morning, and planted three of them in her coffee container. I still remember, her, I still remember that yell from my bedroom. But that was the thing about my mom. She accepted all of our crazy antics and jokes, and, and maybe that was just the occupational hazard of being the mom of three boys. But especially over the last few years, she's let me make a lot of jokes about her getting older, even rolling her eyes as I referred, introduced her to people as my grandma. Or when we'd go, I'd go to museums with my kids and I'd send pictures in our family group chats asking her what it was like to go to high school in the 1940s. <laughs> she loved to laugh and roll her eyes as she created an environment of psychological safety where her family and those around her could be silly and could be themselves. Number four, my mom taught me about the importance of self-efficacy. My mom had an unshakable confidence. When she made up her mind, that was it. She, even when it came to mispronounced words, she would constantly refer to the vitamin supplement em emergency as ingentia or energy Z. From the time that I was, when I was a kid, from the time like, I was in Pokemon, into Pokemon, to now when my oldest is into Pokemon, she still referred to it as Pokeman. Those words would just roll off her tongue with so much confidence, no matter how many times she, she was corrected. Fake it till you make it. She had an answer for everything, and she was my go-to, even into adulthood, for, her, for advice. And her confidence created a sense of security in those around her, that she was a resource that you could lean on. Number five, my mom taught me to pay attention to the little things. To say that my mom took responsibility and ownership seriously would be an understatement. My mom often worked late into the evenings and was still a stalwart at every soccer game and practice. She worked hard for her money and strove to steward it well. One of the ongoing debates that I had with my mom growing up was what temperature to keep the house at. At first, she insisted on keeping the thermostat set to 78 degrees. Let me repeat that, 78 degrees. I see it as a huge accomplishment that by the time I moved out of the house, I got her down to 75. And then with some visits, I, got her to, I convinced her to keep it at 73 while we were visiting. One thing I wasn't able to convince her on was to move beyond single-ply toilet paper, but you can't win them all. <laughs> My mom earned every bit of respect that she received through a relentless pursuit of excellence in everything that she put her mind to. She modeled the importance of paying attention to the little things. And finally, number six. My mom taught me about the importance of faith. Growing up, we attended church regularly, and I saw the way that my mom sacrificially served. Even in day-to-day -day life, my mom did not believe in coincidences, only God winks. She believed in a sovereign God that was good, and the faith that she modeled for me and instilled in me has given me the tools to process her passing and the zeal to carry her legacy forward. My mom's passing is a stark reminder that life truly is short. It's easy to get pulled away from being present. It's so easy to get stuck in the past, consumed with regret or idolizing how great things used to be, or stuck in the future, anxious about the unknown or living in constant anticipation of the next thing. My mom lived, a li my mom lived and loved in the moment. She lived a life of immersion rather than a life of abstraction. And so while we can't take anything with us when we die, we do get to leave plenty behind. I see my mom's love and uniqueness in all of her notes, possessions, and trinkets. I see her selfless generosity and the number of people that have reached out to share their stories. Her legacy will live on in the ways that she shaped the lives of everyone in this room. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Corey. That, um, that was really good. And I think sets the right tone as we consider Gail's life and the impact she's made on all of us. Probably something he said resonated with you and your own personal relationship with her, the attention to detail. So because she served on the leadership team at our church, I mean, I interacted with her on a regular basis in the hallways, et cetera, but on the leadership team that makes a lot of the critical and key decisions of our church, she would sit there, not say anything, not say anything, not say anything. Then I would say, Gail, what do you think? Well, 
and then she would fill in all the blanks of what she thought, and it was always insightful and good. So I agree, her attention to detail was excellent. We're going to sing together. Now remember, I said that we believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And at least a portion of us in this room are going to sing like we believe it. So would you stand and let's join this group behind me and sing to the glory of God. Let's sing of his goodness. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will see of the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able oh, I will see of the goodness of God bless you tonight we sing to you the sun comes up the sun comes up it's a new day dawning it's time to sing your song again Ship here. 
Daryl, I'm one of the pastors here as well, and I too am a part of the Gail Farrow fan club. She was a blessing, so consistently happy. What a blessing every Sunday to see Gail when we came to church, and uh, what, a, what an impact she's left. Uh, as Corey said, what a uh, hole in our hearts she's left for such a huge personality and such a consistent, loving person. I want to read some scriptures from John 14, and we've referred to them uh, already a little bit. Uh, Jesus was trying to prepare his disciples for his departure. Again, he was going to leave a big hole in their midst. In fact, they weren't quite ready for it. They didn't know what to think about it. Peter, to say the most, was, was a little concerned about it. And Jesus gave these words. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. So troubled hearts need to believe. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas spoke up and said, uh, Lord, we do not know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way and the life. 
the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is preparing a place for those of us that know him, and he's the way to get there. God bless you. If you're part of the ones who are sharing, uh, you know who you are. If you would just make your way up here now. Some of the family is going to share. Jeffrey? There. All right. Good evening. I stood watching as the little ship sailed out to sea. The setting sun tinted her white sails with a golden light. And as she disappeared from sight, a voice at my side whispered, She is gone. But the sea was a narrow one. On the farther shore, a little band of friends had gathered to watch and wait in happy expectation. Suddenly, they caught sight of that tiny, tiny sail. And at that very exact moment, when my companion whispered, She is gone, a glad shout out went up in joyous welcome. Here she comes. My name is Jeffrey Wilk, and I'm honored to have worked with Gail at Employee Bridge. To her family, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Gail was my supervisor and mentor, and a respected and recognized leader by those throughout the organization. Most importantly, I considered her my friend, and that's not something everyone always can say about one they report to. Gail was a beacon of positivity and empowered and inspired those around her, especially her team. She fostered a wonderful environment that promoted collaboration, growth, success, and personal and professional ha happiness. Gail never, ever, ever hesitated to roll up her sleeves and stand with us on the front lines to get a job done. She was fueled by her passion for the world of marketing and communications. She was kind, caring, and compassionate. And we are all better individuals because of her. A little backstory. In my prior life, I worked tirelessly for 10 years at another place. I had 12 different responsibilities and managed people across different departments all at the same time. I would be lucky if I left the office before midnight but somehow always is there at 9 a.m. I had no life and couldn't even date for 10 years. I was absolutely determined to grow professionally and claw my way to the top to give 200% every day, all the time. In the end, I was emotionally, spiritually, and physically fractured. I left that nightmare beyond exhausted and was a shell of the person I once was. And on top of all that, I was hit head on by a drunk driver and required major neck surgery. I questioned continuously, was it all for nothing? So what does this have to do with Gail? Have you ever been so scared and terrified that when you yell, your voice come out as a whisper? That was me. I simply lost my voice. But with Gail's light and guidance, she brought me back to life. Metaphorically, she provided the rich soil needed for me to prosper and blossom again. Voice, confidence, ambition, and hope, just to name a few. It was as if my soul was getting a spring shower. Gail, I thank you. Just a year ago now, my father required emergency heart surgery and a few days later suffered a stroke. On I leaned on God and I leaned on Gail. She never failed to send a text, call, or offer a prayer, and her prayers were everything. On office calls, the first words before anything else were, hey, how's dad today? She raised me up when I needed my heart lifted and helped me to stay grounded and laser focused. Gail would love to see photos of his progress, and when he would randomly come front of the camera, she would light up with glee. She often sent me healthy recipes, including some ones for healthy pizza, a craving of my father for months. She, on camera, she spotted him and said, Mr. Wilk, I promise you, you will get a healthy pizza. I wanted to share some two very brief stories, if that's okay. Um, one of them was I was on a conference call one day with Gail, and we were going over a spreadsheet, and everything was fine. Everything was great. It was a beautiful day butterflies out. It was beautiful. 
And all of a sudden, I looked to my right to grab my pen, and there, walking on my desk, was a Costco-sized palmetto bog roach. <laughs> and somebody who's been professional for so long, I knew I would be composed and wouldn't do anything harsh. And instead, in like 10 seconds, I had every expletive as possible, and I took a hardcover book and smashed it down. Needless to say, the roach went everywhere, and all I could see was Gail's face, like Sebastian in The Little Mermaid. It just dropped. And she's like, I gotta go, I'll be right back. <laughs> and all I did was run into the shower, clean myself off, and think the whole time, I just offended Gail. How do I fix this? Like, I didn't even know what, I was like, I, I don't know what to do. Like, I feel so bad. I pro she's probably sick or something. Well, she called me back, Jeffrey, are you okay? I said, yeah, no, I'm okay, are you okay? Yeah. She said, I want to apologize for laughing so much, I had to get off the phone. <laughs> <laughs> but that wasn't what was so great. What was so great was that in 10 minutes she said, I want you to know I got off the phone with Partners Pest Control, I've informed them of the situation, <laughs> and that they will be calling you very shortly. And I'm also sending you an email of all the things around my house of how I can get rid of roaches. Don't worry, Jeffrey, we're gonna get through this together. <laughs> and that was Gail's heart. Um, another brief story I wanted to mention was um, my father has aphasia and um, apraxia from his stroke. So he has a lot of cognitive and speech problems. And so he came up to me one day and he said, there's a big show in New York. And I said, I didn't know what he meant. And I was in a meeting and he said, there's a big show, it's right there, it's right there. So he grabbed me by the hand and he brought me to the door. And it was an Amazon box that looked like somebody took a part of Stonehenge and sent it to me in the mail. I said, what on earth is that? So I went outside and I said, I didn't order anything from Amazon. So I look and it has my name and I lifted it and it was so heavy. So I brought it inside, opened the box and there was one of those little gift cards from Amazon, like a little note. And it says, Dear Jeffrey, this is gonna be fun. Love, Gail. And I'm like, what on earth did Gail send me? I had no idea. She sent me the largest pizza stone you have ever seen in your life to cook a pizza because that was something that um, my dad really wanted. And so, uh, needless to say, for the past few weeks and um, past month, we've been making pizza. And she, I can not tell you, she was laughing so hard on the phone. It was just everything. And I wouldn't trade that for anything in the world. In trying to write these remarks, I sat outside on the porch for a few nights. I played calming meditative music. I stared at the dark, dark sky and just wondered why I felt the burn when I cried. I could crawl into the space between the notes of the sounds and curl my back up to the loneliness, sadness, and void I was feeling. I kept staring at my pen, asking to do it justice and conveying my thoughts about Gail as I wrote this. Then it became clear. Gail was that pen. She was a pen in the hand of a writing God, and indeed, Gail's God, indeed, Gail was God's love letter to the world. I can't read that, it's too difficult. In Gail's honor, I want to remind everyone to live your life and do so with kindness and purpose. Don't be afraid to do something that scares you. Grab your day by its DNA and don't let go. Live in the present. So how do I conclude this? I couldn't find the words. It was then that I, it all clicked in my mind. I sent Gail a Christmas card and after my signature, I added just two simple words. When she received my card and gift, she called me and told me she was so touched by everything, but the words right after my name were everything to her. I love it, I love it, she said. This is how I live my life. So that's how I will bring my remarks to a close. But I will not do so with a period or an exclamation point, but rather a semicolon. 
It was said that death is not the end, but a mere semicolon in the never-ending sentence of life. Gail, thank you for your gift, for being a blessing. This world was never meant for one as beautiful as you. Love endlessly. Good evening. My name is Sandy, and I met Gail almost 27 years ago. Um, we were moving into the apartment, uh, an apartment in Sunrise, and uh, Olivia will always tell you he met me first because moving in, he went over the balcony, he said, hey, neighbor, and he said, come on up when you're done. He said, I come help you, but I'm watching the kids. So after we brought stuff in, I went upstairs, but probably within, I don't know, minutes, Gail whizzed in, and that was the end. <laughs> that was the end or the beginning, because that was the beginning of our friendship. Um, and that journey, you know, was a long and close friendship that it was half of our lives. Um, no one is perfect, but I can tell you that Gail was as close to perfect as anyone could ever be, any human being. She was a force to be reckoned with. I could tell you, kids' parties, she would have, she would whip up last minute cakes and they tasted delicious. They were shaped like Barney or we had pirates themes or what, it didn't matter. It was perfect. Um, she would, uh, weddings, she would plan weddings and wedding, uh, wedding showers and baby showers. And um, she would go to work all day. She'd go to shopping at night. And by the next morning, everything would be set up, everything matched and it was perfect, it was pure perfection. You know, I, would sh I could show a picture of Gail to someone and they would say she was beautiful, but it wasn't her outer beauty that shone through. It was her inner beauty and it resonated even when she walked up to a cashier and would say, hi, are you having a good day? Gail was the epitome of kind, she was selfless. She gave her time, her knowledge and her love freely to her family, her friends, and co-workers. There was not a person I know that met Gail that did not find, you know, feel her loving essence and kind essence. She had an amazing sense of humor. We laughed until our bellies hurt sometimes. And if you know Gail, she had that laugh that was like, hee, hee, hee. And, it, but it was infectious. Um, and it was distinguishable. Her love for her family was fierce. Gail's family was everything to her. She dropped everything and anything to be by her husband, her kids, her kids' spouses, her kids, her grandkids, sisters, cousins, and her mom and dad's side. Didn't matter the time, middle of the day or night, quick flight across the country, she was everywhere. Gail was there for her family 1,000%, and there was never a question of her devotion to them. She was raised by loving and supportive parents, and she raised, raised her own children that same way. And now her children are raising their kids with the love and devotion she taught them. There are a few words that come to mind when I think about Gail, and I'm probably most of you will understand them. Hashtag blessed. Her devout faith. Um, shopping for bargains. Uh, that was her superpower. That was our thing. Shopping was our thing. Marshalls, TJs, Costco. She taught me prob probably, and probably most of you, how to bargain hunt. Always the si sale items first, always. But would always go to the shoes first, too. But I will say that leads to how selfless she was because when we went into a store, we would go to shoes first. I won't say that didn't happen, but next, she would go and she would say, um, let me, I think this would be great for my daughter in law you know, for, for Ashley or the other Ashley or for my sister Gail. She would gather, as they, everybody said, she would gather gifts for the future or just for any occasion. She would send people gifts as, you know, just for any occasion, just because she wanted to. And, you know, those gifts were 
they were th thought through. She thought through every gift she gave, even if it was something little. Um, let's see. Let go to the next one. Um, her fa some of her favorite expressions um, from work. You're a big dog. Um, that's when you did something great. God wink. That's so stinking cute. And sometimes you'd say, and I, that makes me so stinking mad. But the expression that comes to mind most is, oh my word. And when I would, you know, tell the tales of my crazy life, she, that was, I heard that a lot. And I can't get that vision out of my head of her chewing gum and saying, oh my word. And as everybody said, her hugs, her strong and long hugs were legendary. Uh, her long goodbyes on the phone or in person. She, Gail would walk you to the car. You'd, you could be with her for three hours. You'd go to the car, and there was another 20-minute chat. She would hug you. You'd get in the car, and she said, just one more hug. Get out of the car and hug again. She, Gail was a nucleus of her family, and she was the nucleus of a, a lot of her friends' lives. Um, Gail was, she was my, my bestie. She was my sister. How do you explain that closeness? It, it was palatable in every phone call text or in person. I'm sure a lot of you feel the same way about her and that she communicated the same way that I felt. Gail made you feel like you were the most important person in the room and she did it effort effortlessly. All of those that, that met Gail fell in love with her, her affectious laugh, her kindness, grace, and giving nature. Gail, how lucky I was to be picked by you to be your friend. I will be forever grateful for your unconditional love. At the end of each get-together phone call or text, we would say, love you, and we meant it. I didn't know that the Saturday before you left us, that that would be our last hug, or the midweek call would be the last time we'd say I love you. If I knew that, I would have hugged you longer and firmer and would have let you go. But Gail, you will forever be in my heart and always be a part of me. I love you. You were our angel on earth. Hi, everyone. I'm Patty, Gail's sister. Although Gail lived uh, here in Florida, we came up often and uh, there was no distance, I'll just say that. I can't really put it into words, but there was no distance. It was like she never left home. It was texting, calling, driving down the street, just going live so we could just say, look at this, appreciate that. That was all Gail. I just want to give you a little background. Uh, first of all, when I heard about that uh, we were all on the phone together as a family, we heard about the passing of Gail. When that happened, I always thought about how loud she lived her life. She lived her life out loud. And when, uh, when I got the news of her passing, literally the world went silent for me. I sat in my uh, living room, no television for three days. I just was stunned, just could not move. But what got me to move was thinking about how Gail took control when my sister Sandy died suddenly at 44 years old and when my mom passed away from COVID two years ago and when my dad was sick. Through all of those things, Gail was there saying, it's going to be okay, we're going to make it. We all got rocked and then we regrouped and we made it. And I've definitely committed myself to tell the kids, we're still going to make it. We will make it. Gail, from the day mom brought you into our house and introduced you as my baby sister, I was five years old at the time, you brought me so much joy. As a toddler, we wanted to keep treating you as our baby sister, but you were independent and always said, I can do it. You did everything fast. You ate fast. You ran fast. You did things so fast that a family friend used to call you squirrel. In first grade, the teacher brought you to my class 
because you were crying so much and afraid to be alone. You didn't appreciate separating yourself. You did not want to separate yourself from mom and dad. So literally, once you got into school, you wouldn't leave the chair, you would just cry. The teacher came up with a plan that they would take me down to her classroom every couple of hours to just assure her that she wasn't alone in the school. And when I, they'd bring me down to the classroom, Gail would be sitting there like this, looking straight ahead, and I would be over there at the door, and I would wave, and Gail would do this. And she would never look out the door, just move her thumb. As time went on, she adjusted to the school, to independence, and just blossomed where everyone could see this little girl that just ran around and took charge. In first grade, she took charge. We walked to and from school together each day, but she was confident on her own. When she attended Barrington College, she was crowned homecoming queen. One day she called me in October and said, hey, can you send that crown um, to my house so that my granddaughter Isabella could wear it for Halloween? And she was so excited that Isabella was gonna get to wear that crown. From college, she moved back home for a little bit. She, she was literally a strong force in retail and marketing. She worked at the gate post, if anyone remembers that store. The way she accomplished the day's work would make my dad so proud he would drive up to the place just to watch Gail in action. When she married Elidio and moved away, we remained close. Love was always present, felt, and said. There was no distance that could ever separate us. When she would fly home with the three boys, talk about detailed Gail. That was the person that she was. You would see Gail unload the three boys the baby had the pacifier. If the baby's shirt was red, the pacifier was red. Once Gail changed the baby into a blue shirt, the pacifier turned blue. So Gail always matched everything like that. When in high school, she hung her blue clothes on a blue hanger, her red clothes on a red hanger, and her white clothes on a white hanger. So when you talk about the details of Gail, this is where it all came from. She could take care of people and things happening in three different states and accomplished them all. She always made time for family and the business of life. If time seemed to be getting away from us, she would just simply ask for more. Like one day, my husband and I and Gail went to the movies down here, Broward County. Once we got to the theater, we sat down and Gail said, oh no, there's a problem, the movie started. And I said, yeah, she goes, come on, let's go. I'm gonna go down front and ask them to restart the movie. I said, <laughs> I said, Gail, who does that? We can't do that. Yes, we can, come on. We're just gonna ask. So she went to the desk and she said, um, this is my sister Patty from out of town and my brother-in-law Jerome and, um, and we're the only ones in the theater and the problem is that the movie started 10 minutes ago. So I would like to ask if you could just start the movie over. And they said, well, we've never done that before. And she said, you can do it. I know you can. <laughs> and the person proceeded. Gail says, we'll go to the theater. And we'll go into the cinema and wait for it to start over. Sure enough, we sat down. Zoop. There it was. All the credits started over from the beginning. And we had a new beginning to the movie. The only thing I could say about that today is I didn't have enough time with my sister, Gail. I know none of us would ever say uh, there's enough time. I wish in the movie of life that I could walk up to a counter and just say, could you start that movie over so that um, we could have more time. I, but I do know and I believe in Jesus Christ as my savior and I know one day he will start the time over for us and we will see her again. But until then, just think about the time that you have and that life is a movie. And if you have the same power as Gail did and you're in a theater and the movie's late, just ask them to start the movie over. <laughs>
Hello, <clears throat> I'm the oldest sister. Um, my dad used to say I was number one, and I tell them that is true, although my sisters would say you were first born, but you are not number one. Um, we all know that Gail was. The scripture says, hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the ends of the earth will I cry unto thee. And when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for the oppressed, a refuge in time of trouble. The psalmist, and if you indulge me, in Psalm 91 says, She that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Surely He will break the snare of the fowler. He will cover me with His feathers. I shall not fear the terror by night, nor the arrows that fly by day, nor the pestilence that's walking in darkness. For surely the Lord is with me. And because she trusted in him, he has set her on high, and he knows her name, and she knows his. When we think about Gail, I was reminded of a time that we were in my mother's kitchen, and she was getting ready to eat a cookie, and Gail was so spiritual that she began to pray and say grace even over the chocolate chip before she began to pray. There were so many things that we could share about Gail, as already been said, about how much she loved the Lord. She was the epitome and the reflection of God in everything that she said and did. I think all of us would know that when we met Gail, we met that we were looking in the face of God because she just loved everyone. And everyone that knew Gail felt the love of God. And it's evident in this room how many lives that she touched. On the night that we got the call that Gail had passed away. I too, like Patty, was stunned and because we had lost a sister already and lost our parents, the feeling of loneliness or the feeling that a light actually did go out. And reminded of John Elton when he wrote the song for Princess Diane and said, your candle burned out long before your legend ever did. And we all felt that Gail's candle burned out long before her legend ever did. And so I began to pray and seek the face of the Lord and I began to write this letter to Gail. It's called, I Wish. I wish I could see your beautiful face. I wish I could hear your wonderful voice. I wish I could hear you laugh again. I wish we could sit outside and drink coffee in your yard. I wish we could talk about new recipes. I wish we would be so happy when Natalie Grant wrote a new song. I wish I could share how God winked at me today. I wish we could talk about the faithfulness of God in all situations. I wish we could share a new book from my favorite authors, Max Lucado and John Ortberg. I wish I could tease you about the generic Christmas card that you send to all of us every single year. I wish I could call you and cry and talk about how much we miss mom and dad. I wish I could tell you, Gil, I'm at Target. Where are you? I wish I could hear you say it's going to be all right. And in our spirits, we hear that. I wish that I could do owe you and see your grandchildren and see you light up when you saw their faces. I wish I would get a text that says, I'm on my way because it's Luke's birthday and I got to be there. I wish I told you what an amazing godmother you were to Nicole and an amazing aunt to my children. I wish I could hear you discuss design crafts and all different ideas with Dorcas once you got to heaven. I wish I could hear you instruct the Levitical priest on how they should organize the temple and that you would be in charge of all the shelves and how they would organize everything that was there. I wish I could hear you as you began to talk to the Apostle Paul about marketing techniques and expertise. I could hear you tell Paul on the particular font that he should use and what stock of paper he should use when he sent his epistles to the Church of Philippi, to the Church of Corinth, and to Ephesus, and to all the others. I wish I could see you wearing your earbuds, your hat, your sunglasses, your helmet, and the huge smile as you circled your neighborhood. I wish I could see you ride your bike through the gates of Pearl. I wish I could see your face as you met Jesus. I love you so much, Gail, and we miss you dearly. We miss you dearly. I love you forever. This is today. God bless you.
I'm not going to look at any of you because I hate speaking in front of people. Um, but I knew I had to do this for my mom. So the one thing Corey reminded me of was all the times my mom mispronounced stuff, um, the song she mispronounced. Um, the one song she always mispronounced was Baby Shark. Um, she would sing Baby Shark, 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 to Shark, to Shark. <laughs> And I would tell her repeatedly, that's not how it goes, but every single night, babe. And we had a little doll, t I mean, a little toy in the bathtub, and it says it, but she still says it wrong. And it, it, she never got it right, but whew, all right, here we go. Like I told you, I'm not the one that likes to speak in front of people. Um, however, my fears could never keep me from being up here for my mom. My mom is truly the greatest mom that ever walked this planet. Her kindness and overall care to help anyone in her life was second to none. The love she had for her sons, and especially her grandchildren, was unmatched, and she showed it every single day. No matter what she was doing, if someone called needing her help, she would drop everything to either call or she would be driving right over. As many as you know, I do a lot of DIY projects around my house, and my parents are always the first ones to help out when it is needed. He used to always be my dad, but as his health declined and he couldn't do manual labor anymore, my mom always stepped right in. I'm building a gazebo in my backyard right now, pavers and everything. I moved about 60 pavers. My mom was there in the morning, helped me move every single one. I built a swing set for my backyard, huge giant swing set. Um, I wasn't thinking and I built it in the garage. And I told my mom, mom, I need help to bring it out. She said, how are we gonna move this thing? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have a dolly, we're carrying it. And she had the brightest idea. We had my daughter's stroller. We put this, I don't know, the thing is like 500 pounds. We leaned it on the stroller. She's pushing the stroller, I'm pulling the swing set. It took us about an hour and a half to get it back there, but we eventually did. Each one of my projects I do, my parents are always the first ones I call to show them the progress and eventually the final product because they are truly my best friends. I remember calling my mom at midnight on multiple occasions while I was doing a project and she would always answer the phone by saying, why are you still up? You need rest. And like Corey said, she was always asleep, but she always answered my call. As much as my mom loved her sons, she loved their wives just as much. My wife, Lisey, was always afraid of my family when we first started dating because she's a little bit older. <sighs> it's funny because Lisey ended up talking to my mom sometimes way more than me. And if you know me, I talk to my mom constantly throughout the day. <sighs> my mom would always call Lisey after work to ask about her day and just make sure that I always brought home food for Lisey. I remember one night a few weeks ago, I forgot Lisey's food. And my mom called me and said, you forgot Lisey's food? I was like, it's okay, she'll figure something out. She was like, no, come back and get her food. I said, it's fine, she's a grown woman, she can figure out her food. As I was putting Isabella to bed, some, I got a notification on my phone that said someone was at your front door. This is past nine o'clock. I got a text from my mom saying, the food's at your door. My mom really drove 15 minutes to my house to make sure at least he had food. But that just shows you the type of person my mom was. She always took care of her family. The night my mom passed, my parents came to the park with us. There were these little girls at the park that kept telling Maya and Isabella that they couldn't come to the top of the playground. I could still hear my mom's voice. I don't like mean girls. <laughs> she grabbed Maya and she shoved her to the top of the playground and she made sure those mean girls knew it. Then I said, Mom, it's fine. She goes, no, they're going up top, give me her. I said, okay. The mean girls my mom were talking about were two. <laughs> I was like, Mom, come on. No, she brought them up. No matter how old you are, if you mess with her family, she'd put you in your place. We always joke that Kyle's the baby of the family, but I'm the one that could never leave home. I moved out over five years ago, but I always made sure to see my parents each day, if not every other day. 
I always joke that I go over their house so much because, I mean, who wouldn't want free food and babysitting? <laughs> but honestly, I go over there so much because, like I said, my parents are truly my best friends and I love spending time with them. Plus, the free food and babysitting isn't a bad addition. <laughs> now, I think Sandy mentioned Big Dog. So here's the story with Big Dog. So my brothers and I played soccer growing up. My parents were always at every single game in practice. Now, there's two type of parents. The ones that stayed away from the crazy parents, which was my dad, just stayed in the corner, just watched the game. Then there was my mom. She would be screaming, Big Dog, and start barking. <laughs> I could hear her, Big Dog, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I knew exactly where my mom was every single game. Like I said, from beginning when we were six years old, playing rec soccer, all the way up to high school, my mom would just be screaming, Big Dog, bar, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Like I said, she never missed a game and supported us in every aspect of our lives. I want everyone to leave here with this. Life isn't fair, life isn't guaranteed, and life is so short. Like I said, when my mom passed, I was laying on the couch. My mom went to Costco to go get pizza to make pizza for Fridays before she passed. And like I said, life is so short. Now, like I said, I saw my mom almost every single day and talked to her multiple times a day, but I still don't think I saw her enough. So if you still have the privilege of having your mom or your dad be that mama's boy, be that daddy's girl, because at the end of the day, I promise you, you're going to wish you could still be spending time with them. Mom, I know you were listening. And I just want you to know we will still have Friday night pizza nights. Um, I'm not going to be making them anytime soon, um, but we will still have Saturday night burgers, Christmas pictures at the beach, and all the traditions I complained about but secretly loved because it showed us or allowed us to spend time with you. I can still hear your voice so vividly no matter what I'm doing throughout the day. I love you, and I know you'll always be there with me, Lisi, and Maya. They miss their Mimi so much, just, like, just as much as I miss you. But I'm so happy they got to enjoy you as long as they did. I'll end with this. I believe that each day or each time a good person dies, the world gets a little darker. This world got a whole lot darker without my mom, but haven't got a whole lot brighter with her. My heart will always be slightly broken because I can't call you any time of the day, but I know all I have to do is talk out loud and you're always listening. I love you and I miss you so much. As we sing this next song, and we take comfort in these words. It says, glory to our God who gives us life beyond the grave. We know that's what Gail has right now. Let's stand together and let's sing these words. How I long to breathe the air of heaven. Where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets To look upon the one who bled to save me I walk with him for all eternity And there will be a day when all are bound before him Every prayer 
when he returns and wipe away our tears. There will be a day. There will be a day when all will bow before him. There will be a day when death can be no more. Standing face to face with he who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the Lord. And all that day we join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith. And with one voice, a thousand generations sing, Worthy is a Lamb who was slain. Let's sing it again. And on that day, we join the resurrection. We stand beside the heroes of the faith. And with one voice, a thousand generations. Yeah.
Thank you all so much for sharing. Um, <laughs> there's some funny stuff in there. And what a great testimony of Gail's life. This verse on the back of the card, it was so lovingly put together, says, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. That always seems true at a time like this. How do we even pray? But the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. One translation says, with groans that are too deep for words. There aren't even words that match the need. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, all things? Doesn't always feel like that. But the verse says, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I just want to share three things with the background of what I already shared at the beginning about our view of what it means to be a follower of Christ and the different view that death takes as a result of that. But before I do, just to, to reiterate one idea, and that is that we would say, if interviewed in this moment right now, that we are here for Gail. And in a sense, we are, because we're here remembering her and celebrating the impact she has made in our lives, which was so eloquently and beautifully stated by those who came to the podium and shared. And each of us could share stories similarly and differently from those. But the truth is, a memorial service, a celebration of life, is not in its core understanding something that is for the deceased. They're not here. It's really for us. This is for us. We, we need this. And so with that in mind, consider a couple of things. First of all, as I've already said, and I'll say it again, based on Scripture and our understanding of Gail, she is very much alive right now. So we do not, as Daryl read, we do not have to grieve as those who have no hope. She's very much alive. And secondly, one day there will be a service, maybe similar to this one, that's revolved around us. will be the video montage that happens. What will be stated at that time? Services like this always remind us of our own mortality. It was stated in several of the testimonies. Life is short. Wish I could hug longer. Wish I could talk again. Wish I had not left so soon, and on and on. Life is short, short for all of us. It is appointed for man once to die and then the judgment. So we're all gonna die, we're terminal. How will we live until that day? So just a few things. First of all, there is a, an understanding of triumph in tragedy for the death of the Christian. It's a weird mix that doesn't make human sense, but it's because of who God is. Three wonderful things to consider and believe. First of all, death is not outside of God's will. Death is not outside of God's will. In the moment when it happens, or in the illness that leads up to it, or in this case, the sudden event that caused it, we are quick to think God didn't want this to happen. But there is nowhere in scripture that indicates that death is outside of God's will. In fact, we see from one of the greatest Psalms, Psalm 139, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. 
You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed me, and you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. Every one of what? The days that were formed for me. When as yet there were none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I'm still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Oh, men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? I, I do not loathe those who rise up. And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. The psalmist ends with, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Gail has gone in the way everlasting. And we may not understand God's ways, but that they are God's way is certain. God holds absolute authority over our lives. So Corey mentioned this in his sharing about the sovereignty of God, the in-chargeness and authority of God. Our belief in that sovereignty is what really gives us a hope and a future. Because of what we believe Christ has accomplished on the cross, under also the sovereign leadership of God, we also know that God is sovereign even over death. Death is not outside of God's will. Secondly, death is not outside of God's love. We often look at death and say, how could a loving God fill in the blank after that? It's a natural thought to have. When someone close to you dies, there's pain. For there not to be pain would mean you're not alive. So of course there's pain. It's, it's right and, and healthy to have that pain. But to live under the authority of that pain indefinitely means that there's not an understanding of the truth. And the truth is that death is not outside of God's love. In Jeremiah, the prophet speaking about God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. That's God's understanding toward us. And in Isaiah chapter 63, we come to an understanding about God himself, that in their affliction, he was afflicted. In that same passage in verse 9, he begins with the phrase, in his love and in his pity. His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, he died for us and made a way for us. So because of the plan of the Lord's sacrifice and the plan of salvation, the reality of death is no contradiction of his love toward us. It is actually a part of the fulfillment. So death is not outside of God's will. Death is not outside of his love in general for humanity. And third and finally, death is not outside of God's love for Gale. Now, this is when we have all kinds of questions. 
How could a loving God do that? And we don't understand God's timing. I've read in Psalm 139 already that he marked our days before we lived a single one of them. There is absolutely nothing that could have been done, we believe, to have changed Gail's lifespan on earth. These were the days God appointed. I, I know we have this, well, what if, and what if, and I'm, I'm sure there's some of that here. No what ifs. God is sovereign. He made this plan and gave these days. So no matter how difficult and sad Gail's death is to us, it is not so for Gail. Well, that's part of how we come to grips with the love of God, is we consider what is happening with Gail right now. Well, I don't know if she's organizing the marketing department or if she's cheering on some group of children who died young and playing soccer and say, big dog. I'm a little sad she never said that about my preaching. I just want you to know. Because she heard me preach a lot. If I'd known she could say big dog to me, I probably would have requested it. Gail is in the presence of her Lord and Savior. The one who formed her in her mother's womb. She's not sad. Because she's with her Savior. And because we believe that time does not exist there the way it does here. We have such a view of time. Everything is about time here. How many hours in a day? How many minutes in an hour? How much can I get done today? How long will it take to drive here, fly here, do this, do that? 168 hours this week. How can I get the most of them? How long can I sleep this day? I mean, we're all about time. Everything's about time. Things start, finish, begin, begin again. But in eternity, forever, nobody counts time when it's just forever. The Apostle Paul, in writing while he was in prison, he has these letters that he wrote to some of the churches. They're called the prison letters. One of them is the letter to the church at Philippi. He writes, For me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, well, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell, he says. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Well, Gail is experiencing the far better that Paul wrote of in those verses to the church at Philippi. Paul would stay for a good time longer, but eventually Paul got the better, the far better. Again, Paul writes in the great letter of 1 Corinthians, the church at Corinth had a lot of issues, and Paul tried to help them in their struggles and challenges. And so I want to read to you a passage just simply for us to consider, and then I'll close. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 and following. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, this would have been written after the time of Christ, so they're thinking back to his resurrection. How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? So already they were dealing with this in the early church. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is not true that the dead are not raised. 
For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sin. Then those also who have fallen asleep, a biblical euphemism for who have died in Christ, well, they've just perished. They're nowhere. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, they're just in the ground. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, then we're of all people most to be pitied. But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, we know that because Adam died, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, also destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Not even death will have a victory in the end. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him that God may be all in all. Otherwise, so, so if that's not true, if those things are not true, otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? Now, Paul's not encouraging this heretical practice. He's just simply pointing out the fact that people do it. Why? Because they think the resurrection is real. So they're saying, I don't know about my family members who have already gone to their death, so I'm going to do things here on earth to try to help them. And if the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Again, he's not encouraging that, but he's saying, but obviously there's a belief there about resurrection. Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus if the dead are not raised? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. I mean, if there is no resurrection, party! Because this is all we got. A lot of people live life that way. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. But, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person. What you, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be. Thanks be to God. But a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen and to each kind of seed its own body for not all flesh is the same. There are many different kinds. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind. And the glory of the earthly is of another. There's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for stars differ from star and glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. So what is he saying? This, yours, that you're wearing right now, your body, perishable. Perishable. What is raised, imperishable. It's sown in dishonor. The Bible's clear. In this world, we'll have trouble. This world is broken. We're all sinners. We need a Savior. But it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, who is Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. But it's not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. 
Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven, those of us who die in Christ. So, so this passage is why I could say at the beginning of the service and why I declare once again now, Gail is more alive than she's ever been. She's just not here. And that makes us sad. I tell you, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on the immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he gives a final word of encouragement. And I give this word of encouragement to you friends, to you family members, to you co-workers. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for what you did on the cross for us. You have made a way where there is no way. And for that, those of us in this room who know you, we are eternally grateful. Lord, I pray for anyone here who does not yet know you as Lord and Savior, that even today they would come to know you and be changed by what you have accomplished through your life, your death, your resurrection, your ascension, and Lord, by your eventual return. Lord, we also thank you for the privilege of having known Gail. She, one of your children, has been a blessing. Oh, she wasn't perfect, but she emulated a heart and a life that had been changed by you. There is in her hope and love and generosity and humor and humility and kindness and a genuine love and respect for people. Lord, she's that way because of you. You have informed her life and now Though she only saw pieces of it here on earth, now, Lord, she sees fully and clearly. Lord, we have lots of questions that require faith. She has no questions now, and she needs no faith because now she sees. So, Lord, I pray for the day when that will be our story as well. Rejoicing, worshiping, celebrating with you for all of eternity. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a song, one last song before we leave today. In Christ alone, He's the one that makes all the difference. Would you stand?
Christ alone, in Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love in righteousness, scored by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died. Christ, I live. He defeated death. Let's sing this out. And there in the ground, his body lay. Light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day. Guilt in life, no fear in death. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my death. Thank you for reminding us of the victory that is ours in you. I pray your comfort and your peace to everyone in this room, and especially for the family of Gail. Lord, I, I lift to you every person who will be experiencing the pain of grief. I ask God that you would do what only you can do that you would assuage their grief and give them hope and trust in you. Thank you, Lord, that we can trust you in the most difficult of days. You are for us. You will never leave us or forsake us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You're welcome to stay as long as you want. We, there are some refreshments available in the foyer. The family will be here seated just for a little while. If you want to greet them and come and uh, see these beautiful pictures, please come now. God bless you. Go in peace.